So here now the very word of God, as it is given to us in the Gospel of Luke, reading from the 12th chapter, verses 29 through 34. And do not seek what you are to eat and what you are to drink, nor be worried. For all the nations of the world seek after these things, and your Father knows that you need them. Instead, seek his kingdom, and these things will be added to you. Fear not, little flock, for it is your Father's good pleasure to give you the kingdom. Sell your possessions and give to the needy. Provide yourselves with money bags that do not grow old, with a treasure in the heavens that does not fail, where no thief approaches and no moth destroys. For where your treasure is, there will your heart be also. And may the Lord bless this reading of His Word to our understanding. Let's ask Him to bring it alive this morning. Our dear Heavenly Father, as we look at this text and focus now on those first three verses this morning, I just pray that you will impress upon us the, the universality of this statement, especially verse 31, uh, the, the, literally the secret to, to living on this earth, whether you're a Christian and this is the way you are mandated to live, or whether you are a non-Christian, non-believer, and this is the way you should live, and the fact that you don't live this way is something that you will be held accountable for. Dear Lord, help us to understand that we live in a reality that is not your reality, and to be able to make the distinction between the kingdom that we live in and the kingdom that you have brought to this earth now, and that we would understand a true kingdom perspective. In Christ's name we pray. Amen. Amen. First of all, let me apologize a little bit um, as far as uh, the way the, the, the message is presented in your bulletin and the way it's actually going to be. If you look at the outline, you can probably tell that I bit off more than I could chew this morning. Um, and you all are sitting there gasping, thinking, oh my goodness, we're going to be here till 3 o'clock. Uh, and you would be if I didn't divide it. So I, I, I've divided the message. We're not going to deal with all the way through 34. We'll deal with that next week. Um, this week, we're going to focus on the first three verses uh, of this um, really very, very powerful um, 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 segment of scripture. Now, if I was going to rename, and actually I probably will rename the title of this, rather than being Seeking Kingdom Treasure, that's going to come next week. We're going to talk about the nature of that treasure. It would be Seeking a Kingdom Perspective, and, and that's really where we need to establish this morning, is to having a kingdom, a kingdom of God perspective. When I was in college, um, undergraduate, I was a, um, a political science major, and uh, we studied an awful lot of philosophy, political philosophy, and one of the philosophers that we studied was Plato, and we read his book, The, the Republic, uh, quite uh, extensively. And, and so I learned an awful lot about Plato to my detriment at that time because I rejected all the gospel that I had learned as a child and decided that Plato was the one who really had all the wisdom. But he tells a, a story, there's an allegory that, that he brings for it, and I think most of you already know what this allegory is. It's called the allegory of the cave. And it has particular relevance to this morning's message, and so therefore I'm just going to kind of skirt over what that allegory was. He told the story about this cave and prisoners that were held captive in that cave their entire lives. Now what was unusual about these prisoners is that they were tied and bound so that they could not even turn their heads. They were forced to look forward against a big blank wall of the cave. Now just behind them was a wall, something that they could not see. And behind that was a large fire that cast light against the wall. And there were people behind that wall that would take images of people and chariots and horses and things and move them back and forth uh, 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 on top of that 
wall, casting shadows on the blank wall of the cave that was in front of the people. Now, these prisoners had never known any other reality but that. So they believed wholeheartedly that the shadows that they saw on the wall was the only reality that actually existed. Now, I think that Socrates was involved in this somehow. I think what he did is actually come down and grab a prisoner and forcibly take him out and show him that there was a fire behind him and then dragged him out of the cave into the brilliant light of the sun. Of course, it blinded him at first. But then this particular prisoner realized that there's an entire world up there, that the reality that he thought was real, that he thought the shadows on the wall were the reality, were just a shadow and not real at all. And so once he got uh, accustomed to what was up in the sunlight and he saw the light, well, he went back down into the cave to try and tell his other, his fellow prisoners that guess what? What you're looking on at the wall, that's not reality. This is a shadow of reality. But when he went back down into the cave, because he had seen the brilliant light, he was initially blinded because he couldn't see. And so everyone down in the cave thought that he had either been corrupted or gone crazy. So they decided that anyone who came and told them that there was any other reality but the reality that they saw on the wall in front of them, they would kill. Now, now you, you can just apply that to the, the life of Jesus and the what we have called the cosmic initiative where Jesus brings the kingdom of heaven from, from heaven to earth and he comes into this darkened world and begins to tell people that guess what? This is not the reality. There's an entirely different reality that your father in heaven loves you but you're sinful and you cannot stand before him because of his holiness. So therefore you must repent and trust and believe in the son because he has sent the son to set you free. Now, now they didn't believe him because they didn't want to believe him and so they said anybody who says that, anybody who preaches that kind of reality, we're simply going to get rid of. Now, the way that I want us to see that, I'm not going to go deeply into that analogy this morning or that allegory this morning, but what I want you to see is that what mattered and what changed was exactly what we were talking about last week as far as anxiety was concerned. What changed was that prisoner's perspective. The, the, the same shadows were playing on the wall, the same situation, except his perspective had changed so that he knew that there was an entirely different world. When you become a Christian, your perspective changes. And that is what Jesus is going to be talking about this morning, is a change of perspective to pursue, to seek the kingdom of God and not the fallen kingdom that we live in now. Amen. Now, a couple of the ideas that we've been discussing over the last couple of weeks become important here. Um, we've going back a couple of weeks. We were talking about covetousness, and Jesus gave a firm, a, a firm warning to his disciples, actually not just his disciples, everyone he was talking to, that covetousness was something they need to be careful of. Back in the 15th verse, he said, take care and be on your guard against all covetousness. Now we define covetousness at that time as an undue concern or care to control something that you cannot control, to try and control the uncontrollable, and especially to try and control God's providence, to reject His care and to try to take it upon yourself. Well, no, I'm, I'm, I'm talking about anxiety. I switched there. Covetousness, if we go back and we look at the covenants, the exact same principle actually that we've talked about in anxiety and that was that we were we, we were bucking or rebelling against God's providence God provides for us and those who covet are actually saying no God you haven't provided for me well enough I want more. I mean, covetousness is not necessarily just wanting what your neighbor has. Covetousness is wanting more than God provides for you. And so therefore, that whole idea kind of flowed into the next one, the one that I got off on on first, which is anxiety, which is actually the same thing. To be anxious is to rebel against God's providence, to try and control the uncontrollable. Well, both of those ideas are going to come into play this morning as Jesus teaches us that there are two kingdoms. Now, in particular last week, 
when we ended, I said, you know, how, how on earth are we going to follow this commandment? Because that was the command. Jesus commanded us not to be anxious for anything. Now, how are we going to follow that command when every time we turn around, we get anxious? And, and that's when I, I, I said that it was, a, it was a matter of perspective. It depends on where your perspective is. When Peter was walking on the water, his perspective is on Christ. When he looks down, his perspective changed and he sank. If we keep our perspective on the kingdom of God and upon Christ, we are going to be far less anxious about things, far more trusting about things than if we are trying to deal with the, the, the problems of this world and trying to control that which is uncontrollable. Those exact same thoughts are going to come up in our discussion this morning. So keep them in your mind as now we turn our attention to our text, starting in the 29th verse. Jesus says, And do not seek what you are to eat and what you are to drink, nor be worried. Um, now, at first, by, by the way, notice that this is yet another command. He's going to give us two commands in this morning's text. He gives us the command not to seek after the things that we eat and drink. Now, at first, it, it, it almost looks like this is just a repetition of what he said last week when he said, do not uh, uh, be anxious about your life, what you will eat or what you will, your body, what you will put on. But notice that there he said, do not be anxious. And here he says, do not seek. To be anxious is a state of being. To seek is an action verb. It is something that we do. Now Jesus is talking directly to his disciples now. And so he tells his disciples in the things that you do and the way that you live your life, you are not to seek after these things. Now that does not mean, brothers and sisters, that you don't seek for food or drink ever. If you're driving down the road on a family vacation and little Jimmy is hungry in the back seat and he says we need some food and water and you say no we don't seek after food and water that's not exactly what Jesus is talking about Jesus is talking about to give yourselves to that search to 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 do it with abandon uh, to 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 worry over things that you are going to have because that is something that Christians don't do because we trust in the Lord to provide some of those things for us so basically I think what we need to do is we need to define what Jesus Jesus means by seek. Now this is very interesting, at least for nerds like me, because Jesus uses the same word three times. In each one of these verses, he says the word seek. It's the same underlying Greek word. But in each time that he uses it, it's in a slightly different context and therefore has a nuance of a different meaning. Here, negatively, he says, do not seek. Okay. Now, when he uses that, for the most part, seek means what it means in English, to look for something, to try and find something. But there's a nuance to the word in Greek when it is used in this kind of a negative context. Yes, it means to seek information or investigate, to examine, to consider, or even to deliberate. But in this context, it means to seek something irrationally. It, it means to seek after something that you really don't need to seek after. It's something that is, is just completely irrational to be looking for that. Let me give you an example. Uh, most of us drive cars that run on gas, right? And so we're used to looking at the gas gauge. And when it gets down towards E, what do you do? You seek for a gas station, and the closer to the E that it is, the more fervent is your seeking. And so you need to find a gas station if you are going to go farther, unless you're driving an electric car. If you're driving an electric car that doesn't use gas, it's irrational to fervently seek for a gas station. That's exactly what the word means. It's completely irrational for someone to go and be worrying about the things that God is going to provide anyway. And so therefore, the first seek that Jesus says is a, is, is a, a, a rational seeking. Now, 
The second word that we need to define here is the word worried because he says do not be worried. Now I just want you to notice this that last week he talked about anxiety. This week he talks about worry. Next week he's going to talk about fear. So he's got all of them included here. Anxiety, fear, and worry. He doesn't want you to be having these kinds of sensations at all. Now the word worry is a little bit different than the word anxiety, the way that it is used. It, it, it's, it's a difficult word to translate because it is, this is its only usage in the New Testament. So therefore we can't compare it to some other usage to try to get an idea of what it means. Now it is used in the Greek version of the Old Testament and it is also used in secular Greek, but it doesn't seem to make sense because there it talks about to lift up or to exalt or to soar above. It can even mean arrogant or proud and in fact some of the early church fathers thought that that's exactly what Jesus was saying but that's really not the meaning of it. it, it, it let me just give you an example. It, it means to um, to be on a, 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 a like being on a ship on the high seas in, in, in rough weather. Uh, uh, Pause a second. Bob, we've got a flashing red light on that one. Probably it's not uh, um, uh, getting the juice. Sorry, I, I, I can see that from here. <laughs> but anyway, th let, let me see if I can give you an example. When Kay and I were married, we, were, we had a great gift. Her father gave us a gift of a honeymoon in Acapulco. So we went to Acapulco for our honeymoon. So we're in the Pacific Ocean and we're deep sea fishing in this little old Mexican boat. All right, so Kay and I are down at the bottom of the boat. It's a diesel boat, and all those fumes are coming in our face. On the flybridge, we've got two big burly fishermen that do this all the time. We're in 40-foot swells. Now, I don't know if you've been in a swell, but a swell is not like a rough sea where you're pounding against the sea all the time. A swell is like one minute you're 40 feet up, and the next minute you're 40 feet down. And it just keeps going up and down, and you can imagine I'm green. Okay, and, and, and I'm thinking, how on earth am I ever going to make it through this, this? Well, about that time, Kay caught a 140-pound marlin, okay? And she fought it for 45 minutes, and I grabbed my camera, and sure enough, I forgot all about being sick. But anyway, that idea of being way up and being way down is the idea of what it means to worry. It is to vacillate between truth and falseness, to vacillate between doubt and faith, to vacillate between God's kingdom and the kingdom of this world, to live in the middle because that creates a, a, a situation of worry. Okay, so put those two together. What Jesus is saying, do not seek things you don't have to seek. Don't go out on irrational seeking ventures to find things that God is going to give you anyway because the only thing that you're going to do is create worry. All right? Okay, so that's the, that's the first part of what he says. Then he goes on on the next page. And he says, For all the nations of the world seek after these things, and your Father knows that you need them. Jesus refers to all the nations. I, I think that most of you know that the word that underlies that is the word for peoples and it is quite often translated as Gentiles. He's talking about those outside of the covenant that God has made with the Jews. But the fact that he says all the nations of the world really expands it. It, it talks about every single individual who is not included in God's covenantal relationship. It talks about the pagans. It talks about the, the heathens all around the world. It talks about those who are not believers in a New Testament context. And so Jesus says you don't need to be seeking after these things because all the nations of the world, all the Gentiles, all the people who do not believe and are not seeking the things of the kingdom seek after these things. Now, once again, you can see that we're not just talking about bread and water. We're not just talking about food and water. We're talking about your life force, the things that are important to you, the things that you pursue, the things that are of the greatest value to you, the things that you need, but also sometimes the things that you don't need. That's what those who do not know Christ, who do not know God, who are still at enmity with God, these are the things that, that they um, seek after. Now, once again, 
we have another meaning to the word seek. This time, there's a little word, a preposition, that's prepended to the word. It's the little word epi that means on or over, but what it does is it intensifies the meaning of the word. So in other words, it's not just to seek, but it is to seek desperately. It is to seek fervently. It is to have your total focus in singularity, focused on the things of this world and not at all on the things of God's kingdom. I think about those people down in that cave uh, of Plato's allegory. The only reality that they knew was the reality of the shadows in front of them. It is no different in this world, brothers and sisters. The only reality reality that people know is the reality that they can touch and, and feel with their senses, is the one that they're in, in the midst of. And they have no concept that there is an entirely different reality here, that there's a whole kingdom, that, that there's a, a, a whole different uh, a, a, a set of values that do not exist in, in this world. Now, what Jesus says this, what he is doing is he is calling on Christians to live a different life. And, and, and the word really is separate, to separate out from this world. The word separate, it really, the word holy means to be set apart. And that's what Jesus is calling us as Christians to do. This kind of behavior, in other words, this kind of seeking, and to seek after these things are, is, is, is not acceptable for the Christian. It, it, these are not things that we need to be worrying about and fervently, singularly seeking after because there's a whole kingdom of God that should occupy our focus. And we're going to see that coming up actually in the, 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 the next verse. But brothers and sisters, there is a major problem that develops when the church is indistinguishable from the world around them. And even worse, when the church has decided that the way to reach an unsaved world is to be just like them so that they are not uncomfortable in their sinfulness. And that somehow the righteousness of Christ is just going to rub off by osmosis or something like that. When the, wor when the church begins to look more like the world than the world does, then the church has a major problem because Jesus has called us out of this world into his world, into his kingdom. Even though we live in this sewer, folks, our citizenship is in the kingdom of God. And that is exactly where he is going to go at the end of this when he, he, he gives us the assurance of a, a compassionate oversight. Notice what he says. For all the nations of the world seek after these things and your father knows that you need them. Notice that he falls back into the language of the Trinity. He has been doing this all through this, folks. I have made it clear each time that he has gone into this that Jesus is introducing our loving, compassionate Father. Uh, if, if you remember, those of you who have been here for this study, that this is uh, whole discussion starts when Jesus, we're celebrating Advent, the Advent of Jesus Christ. We've called it the Cosmic Initiative, where Jesus leaves heaven and comes to this darkened planet to bring the truth. And he has a threefold objective, more than threefold, but we've just talked about three of them. The first, he came to destroy evil. He did not come to make an alliance with evil. He came to ultimately destroy it. Secondly, he came to seek and save the lost, to find his elect, to purify them, and to eventually lead them back as a train of captives to present to his Father. But thirdly, he came to reveal to us the triune nature of God. It's Jesus who is the most clear about the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. And we have seen that in the way Way that he has gone through. Remember, when he was talking about the culpability of humans to God, he talked about the Father, fear 
of God. I'll tell you who to fear. Fear the one who can send body and soul to hell. And then the Son, if you deny me before men, I will deny you before my Father in heaven or before the angels of heaven. And then the, the Holy Spirit, the blasphemy of the Holy Spirit, of course, would be that unforgivable sin. So Jesus has been expressing and, and teaching us that the nature of God is triune, three persons in the same being or the same essence. But he has been explaining to us that quite often our vision or our idea of our Heavenly Father is, is of, of an angry God. And we do talk about His wrath, but Jesus wants us to know for those who are saved according to His purpose, those who are called out of darkness, the ones that He has chosen, He is a loving, compassionate, nurturing, nourishing Father. He has said things like this back in the 11th chapter, If you then, who are evil, know how to give good gifts to your children, how much more will the Heavenly Father give the Holy Spirit to those who ask Him? He has told us that the very hairs of our head are numbered. He has told us that we are of more value than many sparrows. When he gave the examples of how not to be anxious, he gave an example of the ravens who do not store or, or, or sow or harvest. And the example of flowers through the field, they don't toil or spin. And in both of those, he made the argument from the lesser to the greater. You are of far greater value than those. So he has been, he has really been teaching us the importance of the fatherhood of God. And, and I like the way that John MacArthur puts this in, in his commentary. He said, understanding God's fatherhood removes any legitimate cause for worry, fear, or anxiety. If you understand the kind of father that you have, now granted, we fear God. And Jesus says, I'll tell you who to fear, fear or fear him. But it's a healthy fear. It's the fear of, 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 a, of a child to their parents. And, and, and it's the kind of fear that's set the right relationship. And then Jesus turns right around and says, but wait a minute, not you. Those of you who know your father, you just need to realize how much your father completely and totally loves you. Um, I, I read one of the great old um, Puritan pastors and theologians, his name is John Owen, and many of you know him. He has a whole segment where he tries to teach us how important it is that we as Christians receive the love of the Father. The Father loves you whether you're going to receive it or not. But the beginning of your growth as a Christian is when you receive, when you comprehend the degree that your Father loves you. He writes this, when the Lord is by His Word presented as a Father who loves you, then Think about it and accept it. You do not hold communion with God in anything until you receive it by faith. And just as you receive your salvation by faith, you receive the love of the Father by faith. And that is one thing that Jesus is drilling into us because He wants us to know that you don't need to worry about anything because your Father in heaven knows you need them. He knows what you need. Does that mean that there's never going to be a time that you're not going to have need, that you're not going to find yourself without food or drink? And you might go through valleys and times of difficulty? Of course not. But God in His providence and God in His compassion and God in His love has provided for you. So why on earth would you try to take that on yourself? Why on earth would you go out and to, to worry about the things that you're going to eat, the things that you need for life? God has provided all those things for you. But I will add one thing to this. God's love is two-sided, folks. We need to remember this. God is zealous in His love for us. But the flip side of that coin is he's also jealous. The same word in Hebrew for both of those. He is a jealous God and will not abide his own worshiping the gods of this world in any way, form, or fashion. He is calling us to a complete and total separation. And that becomes absolutely clear in what he says next. Notice the 31st verse, which is one of the great verses in all of Scripture. This, along with Matthew 6, 33, really are some of the most important that we have before us. Instead, seek his kingdom, and these things will be added to you. That word, instead, your translation might translate that as but. 
that is a strong adversative. And it is a word that is designed to give the positive answer to a negative statement. So the negative statement that has already come out is verse 29 when Jesus says, and do not seek instead rather. It, there's a completely fine line. It, it is theologically defined and infinitely thin. There's no crossover between these lines as is so often the case. You are on one side or the other. There is no gray area. You either live in the kingdom of God or you live in the kingdom of this world. You were either saved or you were not saved. And when Jesus says, do not seek fervently the things of this world, the exact opposite of that, the flip side, the command of what you will seek is his kingdom. And when he refers to his kingdom, oh by the way, let's, let's talk about that word seek. I told you that there's three different meanings here. Now when he, when he says seek on this time, same exact word as he used earlier when it was negative, but oddly enough the word takes on a slightly different meaning when it's used in the positive. And, and, and here's what the word means, to devote serious effort to realize one's desire or objective, to strive for, to aim, to try to obtain, to desire. However, there is, first of all, there is no connotation of an irrational search here. In, in other words, it's a completely and totally rational search. It's the kind of search that you should be making. But just like we talked about hope earlier, it is a search. It is to seek for something that you know is there. It is not to seek for something that you may or may not be there, that you heard somebody say in an offhanded way that it might be there. It is to seek for that which you already know is real and you are just following it. You are pursuing it. It becomes your objective. And that is the way it is with the kingdom of God, brothers and sisters. We know about the kingdom of God. We don't have to have anyone tell us that there's another kingdom because we've been saved out of this one and saved into that one. And we have the reference of the Holy Spirit who tells us and convinces us that there is another kingdom besides this one. So to seek that kingdom is to seek something that you absolutely know is there and there is no thought of an irrational um, search. Kay and I were watching, uh, I, I mentioned this about hope. We were watching, uh, you know, it's December, so we watch old Christmas movies. In December, you know that we watch all these old black and whites. And so last night we were watching The Miracle on 34th Street. Uh, and many of you know that, that great old movie. But at the end of the movie, the mother is trying to convince her skeptical daughter to put her faith in Santa Claus. And so the daughter is sitting there saying, it just doesn't make any sense. It's just totally irrational. And the mother, it makes me cringe every time I hear it. The mother says, faith is believing in something that you know isn't true. Faith is believing in something that doesn't make any sense to you. It's to put your belief. So believe in Santa Claus. Of course, she believes in Santa Claus and the end of it. But that's not faith, folks. That's not faith. That, that's not the kind of seek that we have here. True Christian faith is to believe in something that you know is true without a question. That's what faith is. It's not a blind leap. And this seeking is not blindly seeking for something that you just think might be there. This kind of seeking is seeking for something that you absolutely know is there. So what is it that we are being told to seek? His kingdom. Okay. Um, his kingdom, the his, refers back to your Father, Heavenly Father. So basically the kingdom is the kingdom of your Heavenly Father, or in other words, the kingdom of God. Matthew uses the phrase kingdom of heaven. We're not going to go into any nuances between those two or three. They're all talking about the same kingdom, the kingdom of God. Now, as I've said on many occasions, to try and describe what the kingdom of God is in one small, concise set of words is impossible. Uh, in fact, that's what this whole book of, of Luke is about. He's, that's what the name of the series is, is the kingdom of God. And so he's explaining to us in the whole book, but let's at least, since we are being commanded to seek for it exclusively, we kind of have to get an idea of what it is. What is the kingdom of God and what does it mean to seek 
the kingdom of God. Well, a kingdom in general, um, and I'm sure there's more aspects that you need to have, but you must have at least three aspects in order to have a kingdom. Number one, you have to have a king, and the king is sovereign. The king rules over his territory. In, in worldly kingdoms, we, we, we have queens as well. But keeping it in the context of the kingdom of heaven, we're going to look at kings. A king is sovereign. To be sovereign means that no one tells you what to do. Your will becomes law. If you say it, you don't have to justify it. You say it and it is the, the, the will of, of the kingdom. So you have, first of all, a sovereign king. Secondly, you need a dominion over which that king is sovereign, over which he rules. In earthly kingdoms, that's usually some boundaries, a place. You may have two kingdoms right next to each other with two kings. Well, one king's sovereignty stops at the borders of his kingdom and the other king's sovereignty begins. So within that dominion, however, the king is absolutely sovereign. The third aspect of a kingdom is that it has subjects. It has subjects. Now, they may not be loyal to the king. We don't want to say that. But they are subjects nonetheless because they are under the king's authority. They're under his jurisdiction. They are under his rule. So whether or not they rebel against the king or not, they are still his subjects. You need those three entities or those three elements in order to have a kingdom. Well, when we take those three elements and we apply them to the kingdom of God, there's only one being that is sovereign in the kingdom of God, and it's not you, and it's not me. There's only one sovereign in this kingdom, and it is God. The triune God is the sovereign king of the kingdom of God. His will is law. What he says goes. No one tells God what to do. No one pushes God into a corner and makes him jump through hoops like so many people think that he does. I form a word in my head, and then because I believe in it, God is bound to, to bring that word about. I claim something, and because I claim it in faith, or I say I claim it in faith. Now God is bound. He is obligated to do that. I decide I want to follow Jesus, so God has got to save me. I'm sorry. God is sovereign, and if you don't understand sovereignty, you're not going to understand the kingdom of God. Mm -hmm. God is absolutely sovereign within His kingdom. So what are the boundaries of His kingdom? What is His dominion? Well, God is infinite, so therefore His dominion must be infinite. God is eternal, so therefore His dominion must be eternal. God is um, omnipotent, so His power exists over all of His kingdom. He's omniscient, so there's nothing within that kingdom that He doesn't know. He's omnipresent, so there's no place within that kingdom that He is not. And He is sovereign over all that place. That means that God's dominion is heaven, hell, the earth we live on, the universe we live in, and every dimension that we may be ignorant of. There is nothing in the created existence of cosmos that is not the dominion of God. So God is sovereign over all that there is, no matter where it is. Who are the subjects of God's kingdom? Well, everything that's alive. <laughs> right? There, there's, there's no one, and I'm talking technically now, there's no human being who has ever lived or who ever will live. There is no angel. There is no fallen angel. The devil himself are all the subjects of God's kingdom because they are under his sovereignty and his authority. But that's a very technical um, example uh, or a very technical way to look at it because when we actually talk about the kingdom of God and the advent of the kingdom of God and, and the cosmic initiative as we have talked about that, well, well the, 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 those who are rebellious against God because God has ordained that they will, the, that the weeds will be allowed to, to live with the wheat all, all through that, uh, they, they really are, yes, Yes, they're subjects, but they're really not subjects. They're not loyal subjects. They're not obedient subjects. So when we talk about the subjects of the kingdom of God, it's, it's even as we said just a little while ago when we said the Lord's Prayer, Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on 
earth as it is in heaven. There's a place where God's will is done completely and totally, and it's not earth because there are so many people at enmity with him, not doing his will, but they're still subjects. So that is the kingdom of God, and that's what it means. So with that said, what does it mean to seek the kingdom of God? What is Jesus commanding us to do? Well, first and foremost, brothers and sisters, the greatest commandment in all of the Old Testament is you shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, mind, soul, and strength. And so to seek the kingdom of God is to seek the king. It is to adore him. It is to love him. It is to praise him. It is to honor him. It is to worship him. It is to desire to please him. It is to have him ever in front of you. It is to follow him. It, it, it is to, to listen to him when he says and to have a real built-in desire to, 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 be, to have him be pleased with what you do. That, that is the very first part of what it means to seek the kingdom of God. You seek the king of the kingdom. But the second part of it has to do with the behavior of a kingdom dweller. There's another aspect of the kingdom that we need to bring out here. And that is that within the kingdom, there are standards, there are behavioral standards that God establishes. We have talked about them as the ethical standards of the kingdom. Now, when you talk about ethics. When you talk about an ethical standards, they are just that. They are standards. When you talk about morality, it is the degree to which you either keep or do not keep those standards. You're a moral person if you keep the standards. You're an immoral person if you don't. But the standards remain the same. And so Jesus has just given us a hint in the book of Luke of what some of the standards are of the ethical, uh, the kingdom ethics. He said this back in the sixth chapter, I say to those of you who hear, love your enemies, do good to those who hate you, bless those who curse you, pray for those who abuse you, to one who strikes you on the cheek, offer the other also. From one who takes away your cloak, do not withhold your tunic either. Give to everyone who begs from you, and from the one who takes away your goods, do not demand them back. And as you wish that others would do to you, do so to them. These are the standards of the kingdom. So part of what it means to seek the kingdom is to seek the standards, to seek to live the life of those standards, to seek your own personal righteousness based on not the righteousness of your culture, but the righteousness of the kingdom. And by that to bear righteous fruit for the kingdom. If you'd want to know what righteous fruit is, come back tonight because that's our subject, is what righteous fruit actually is, the righteous fruit of the kingdom. Of course, we're moving to Philippians, but Paul is talking about exactly the same thing. So to, to live a life of personal piety and personal righteousness, to give everything that you possibly can to follow closely in the, the standards that God has put forward, both in His moral standards that remain from the Old Testament, the Ten Commandments, and the way that Jesus brought them out, particularly in the Sermon on the Mount, three chapters in Matthew, where He goes deeply into what the ethical standards of the kingdom actually are. To keep those is part of what it means to seek the kingdom of God. But it's not just to seek them for yourself. It's not just to, uh, to, to say, okay, I'm, I'm, I'm going to take care of my own personal piety, and then I'm just going to sit here in my four walls and be as righteous and biased as I possibly can. No, it, to seek the kingdom is to want to see the kingdom established throughout this fallen world and to work tirelessly for it. Jesus worked tirelessly to bring the kingdom of heaven here to earth to establish it. His apostles did the same thing. The disciples they made did the same thing. All down throughout history, there have been kingdom workers who have done exactly the same thing. And so therefore, we, we want to tell the world about Jesus. I mean, to evangelize the world and to stand up against the culture to call sin, sin when it is, to, um, to, to stand against the culture no matter how um, difficult it might be. 
that's what it means. And again, that's just a, a smattering. I'm not going to go in what it means to, to follow the kingdom in the here and now as opposed to the not yet. It's very complex and it goes on and on. But let's continue with the text because there at the end of verse 31, he says, instead, seek his kingdom and these things will be added to you. All the things that you thought you wanted will be added to you. Uh, what this does is this brings out, this reflects the upside down nature of the kingdom of God. If, if, if you seek after the things of this world, it's going to cause you nothing but pain and anxiety and worry. But if you forget about those things and you seek his kingdom first, it, it doesn't mean he's not going to give you the things of the world. It, it doesn't mean, you know, quite often we, we see that, 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 that the Lord gives us the desires of our hearts. And it's almost always in a different way than you actually desired it, okay? Before I was a Christian, I, 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 I was an empire builder, okay? I thought, well, I wasn't a good one, but that's what I, my intentions were. I, I was going to build empires, right? I was going to be very wealthy, and I wanted certain things. I wanted big houses. I wanted big cars. I wanted a great big estate uh, in the mountains uh, of, the, of Tennessee, and I, and, and I, and I wanted to travel. And, and I did none of those things because when you're seeking those things, they are a harsh taskmaster and they own you. And, and, and if you're not getting them, then you are a tremendously wrapped up in worry. But when I became a Christian, those things became, were not interesting to me anymore. I didn't pursue the things of this world. Rather, I pursued the kingdom of God. And lo and behold, God started giving me stuff that, um, revealing stuff that I had wanted, but I used to make a joke about this all the time. I'm getting the heart, my, the desires of my heart, they just all belong to somebody else. <laughs> and that was true. You know, I, I might be able to enjoy a nice estate up in the mountains, but they didn't belong to me. I got to travel the world. Now I didn't stay in fine hotels. I'm going from slum to slum, but nonetheless, I got to see an awful lot of places. So it's never exactly the way that you think it will be, but God does provide the things that were important to you and you don't even have to worry about them. And if you spend your life chasing the riches of this world, those riches own you. And, and, and if you don't, even if you have them, they, they don't own you. I, I have the greatest respect, and people sometimes think that I don't, but I have the greatest respect for those few individuals that God uses to, to, to bring great wealth to. And, and one of the reasons I have respect for them is because they bring resources out of a fallen world into the kingdom rather than vice versa. Okay, And I have great respect for that because that is one of the ways that God provides for his kingdom. Not all of us, me included, can, can handle that. So therefore, God doesn't do that. But in other words, those people that he brings that great wealth to, that wealth doesn't own them because they can do without it. If God takes it away, that's okay, because that's not their focus. That's not what they are seeking. They are seeking the, um, uh, the kingdom of heaven. Now, as, as we just, we're just going to stop uh, at these three verses. Next week, we'll get into the treasure. But I, 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 I want to comment on this just a wee bit. Um, the way that that puts it, when we put it into the context of the way that Jesus is saying that, it doesn't really make a lot of sense for a Christian to seek after the things of this world rather than to seek with abandon, with fervency, the things of the kingdom. But I kind of find that this is the sort, sort of the same situation as we had when we talked about anxiety. We all know that Jesus commands us not to be anxious, and we all break that commandment every single day. And we all know that Jesus commands us to seek first the kingdom of God and His righteousness, and all these things will be added to you. But we also break that one every day. There are so many Christians who are pursuing the things of this world and not pursuing the things of the kingdom. So I think we have to ask ourselves why. What are the reasons that Christians who know better, who know that Christ has, has commanded us to seek the kingdom of heaven, why is it that we seem to be so locked up in seeking the things of this world, seeking the things that the unbelievers seek? Well, there are several reasons for that. I think one of them is necessity and expediency. I mean, you have a fire, 
got to put it out, right? I, I mean, you, 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 you got to focus on something because it's right in front of you. And if you don't, there's going to be even worse consequences to it. So therefore, you, you, you find yourself going from fire to fire, right? And our enemy is really good at starting fires that will divert your attention away from the kingdom of God. And I think part of the problem is, is that we don't recognize that fires sometimes go out by themselves if our Lord doesn't want them to burn. And, and therefore, that might not be our fire that we have to put out. So we don't want to lose our focus or our perspective. But I do think that that is one of the reasons that, 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 that people lose sight of following the kingdom of God. I think another reason is because our our value system gets hijacked. Our value system, uh, we begin to value the things or to consider things of value as, as being the things that are the same thing that the world considers to be a value rather than the things that are actually a value. And, 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 and just give you an example, uh, um, what, what is your definition of success. Those of you who are parents, when you teach your children and you want them to be successful, well, what, 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 what do you teach them? Well, you start out by saying you need to make good grades in school. And they say, why do I have to make good grades in school? Well, in order to, to get into a good college. Well, why do I have to get into a good college? Well, in order to get a good job. Well, why do I have to get a good job? Well, in order to make a lot of money so that you can attract a good spouse, so that you can have the nice things that we've provided for you and that you can turn right around and provide them to your children and teach them the same value system that we're teaching you now. And by the way, all the way along, you need to salt money away so that when you get to be my age, you can quit work and live off of that money. Now, I'm not saying there's anything wrong with that. I'm just saying that that's not the kingdom value system. Brothers and sisters, there's no retirement in the kingdom of God mm -hmm. at all, Good. ever, okay? You go out of this world kicking because that you, the, the Lord has reason and use for you right up until he takes you home. Uh, otherwise, he'd probably take you home right now if he didn't have a use for you. So therefore, there's no retirement in the kingdom of heaven. But I think we, we, we've accepted that value system and... and, 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 and uh, we don't want to kick against the goads, if you will, or kick against the kingdom. And sometimes I think that's the way, the way it is. I, I think we just, it is such an uphill battle to accept the value system of the kingdom and to determine and define success that way. I kind of feel like those poor salmon in, in, in Alaska. You know those poor guys? You know, they're just swimming around in the ocean and everything is fine. And all of a sudden, something clicks inside of them that says, you've got to go miles up this stream that is blowing water right in your face. You've got to swim against the current. And every time you come to a cataract, you've got to jump it. And, and if you can't jump it, you've got to die trying. Okay? And so they fight and they squirm and they give all their energy and they finally, they, they get up over that cataract and what is on the other side of that cataract but a big old grizzly bear that's an expert at catching salmon in the air. Yeah. Well, you know what that grizzly bear is, don't you? That's the culture. Because you're fighting upstream when you're trying to, to live by the value system of the kingdom and the culture is so good at picking you out of the air. The culture is so good about twisting and turning that value system so that you begin to put value on things that really aren't valuable. And then you begin to say, I need those things that you really don't need. And so all of a sudden you don't pursue or seek the kingdom of heaven. But I think the main reason, at least as far as this morning is concerned, is that we need a change of perspective. We fall into the same perspective that those prisoners down in that cave live under. They see the shadows on the wall and they think that is reality. And what they need is a change in perspective. And just like we did under anxiety, you say, Pastor Kirby, now listen, I, I have to go take care of the fire. I've got to put food on the table. I have to work and it takes a lot of my time that I need to focus on my job or else my family's not going to be able to have food. And I agree with that. I'm not saying that. But I want to ask you a question. When the Apostle Paul woke up in the morning, what do you think he thought? 
when he planned his day? Do you think that what he actually thought is, how am I going to be able to make a better tent so I can get more business? Because he was a tent maker. That's what he did. That's how he paid the bills, okay? Do you hear much about Paul's tent making? Did he have a tent making business with, uh, with, with, with satellite operations in every town that he built a church? You know, well, I'm going to build my tenting business and on the, on the side I'll talk about Jesus. No, it was the other way around. What about Peter? What do you think Peter thought about when he woke up in the morning? How can I get more boats, you know? How, maybe, maybe, maybe there's other places that I can get fishermen and I can take the skim. I, I can, how can I corner the market on fishing? That's not at all what he thought about. He, he thought about the kingdom of God. He thought about the, 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 the evangelizing of telling the world that needed to hear about Jesus, to tell them about Jesus and to stand against the culture when he had to do it. This, this, is, what, th this is what it means. It was Jonathan Edwards who said this, and I think this applies to every single one of us. Jonathan Edwards, one of the greatest theologians that this country has ever produced. He says, I don't care how you make your living. I don't care how you put food on the table. I don't care what you have to do during the day in order to survive. Your occupation is Christian. Now, you may make your money doing something else. You may have another career. But the time you accept Christ as your Savior, your occupation is Christian from that point on. That's a kingdom perspective. And I think it's the fact that we don't have that perspective that so often leads us into a situation where we are, we are not pursuing the kingdom of heaven. There's, there's another one that we're going to deal with next week, which is, I don't think we understand the nature of heavenly treasure. I think if we understood the treasure of heaven, we would not spend one minute trying to build up the treasure of earth. There's just no comparison. We'll talk about that next week, but that brings up the very last one. I believe that it is a problem of belief. It's a problem of faith, brothers and sisters. If you really believe what the Bible says, if you really believe what Jesus just said, if you take that as a promise, then you're not going to spend your time pursuing the things of this world. You're going to spend your time pursuing the things of the kingdom. You are going to worship every chance you get. You are going to inundate yourself with the Word of God. You are going to spend time in prayer. You are going to pursue personal righteousness and to live according to the ethical standards of this earth. You are going to do whatever you can do to establish the kingdom, to grow the kingdom of heaven here on this earth by sharing the gospel, by telling people about Jesus, by standing against the culture, by living the life of a kingdom dweller because your citizen citizenship is not in this world you are sojourners yes. your citizenship is in the kingdom of God yes. and to seek it is not to seek something that is a myth it is to seek after something that you know is there and to give your life to it amen, amen. let's pray <laughs> Heavenly Father we thank you for the instruction that Jesus gives us I just pray for each and every one of us um, both a, as a pastor and just as a, a fellow brother in Christ, that we, we take this to heart, yeah. that each one of us grow in the way that we can grow in you by faithfully seeking your kingdom and, and, and what it is and what it means. Oh, dear Lord, there are so many reasons for us to turn to this way or that way to forget and, 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 and you have called us not to. So I just pray that you would give us the strength, the forbearance, the zeal, actually, the, 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 the excitement to seek your kingdom rather than the kingdoms of this world, which are old and stale and tired and they bring nothing but trouble, that we would give you the glory in that. In Christ's name we pray. Amen. Amen.